So what happened in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago that would impact our life today? Something incredible happened in that manger. The Father God came to dwell among us that Christmas in the manger. The ultimate Father Christmas, the Father we've longed for, the Father we've hoped for, came to dwell among us. Yet for many of us, we've never had the opportunity to discover this heavenly Father because we've been shaped by images in our culture, in our time, that have affected our ability to fully embrace and fully rejoice and fully understand that Father Christmas. Think of it, when when I say Father Christmas, most of us think of Santa Claus, right? And depending on what culture you grew up in, even your view of Santa Claus is different. Most of us in America, the reason we picture Santa Claus the way we do is because of Coca-Cola commercials over the years. But if you look at different images of Santa Claus and different names of Santa Claus throughout the cultures, you learn there's very, very different traditions. Here's St. Nicholas, known as the Wonder Worker. I'll tell you a little bit about him in just a moment. Father Christmas, an American figure for Santa Claus. Jultimaten, the Swedish one, the Swedish one there. And there's other ones. How about this? Other cultures. We have, uh, next slide. So, Dead Moros, translated the Old Man Frost. Sinker Claus, traditional red cape and white beard and jolly attitude. Or Pierre Noel, a well-known version of St. Nicholas from France. Or maybe you've heard of the, the story of Krampus. You know who Krampus is? Oh, if you grew up with like uh, s- Christmas being about Krampus, Krampus is like this evil spirit from the underworld who comes at Christmas and will drag you down to the underworld if you're not good. Whoa, that might affect your love of Christmas. But where did Santa Claus get all these names? Santa Claus, Father Christmas, St. Nicholas. Let me talk about St. Nicholas for a moment. Because St. Nicholas was an actual man in history. He was born to parents who were struggling with infertility. So when Nicholas was born, they celebrated that they had this miraculous child that they felt given to them by God. And they really felt and began to realize he had a very strong interest in spiritual matters. So they took him and raised him, really, in the church where he became a follower of Jesus and the Bible. And as he grew, he became an explainer and defender of what the faith was really about, that the main message of the Bible is that God came from heaven to earth to die and forgive for every one of us, that we didn't have to live under a big blanket of guilt, that we could know our Heavenly Father. In fact, it was St. Nicholas at the Nicene Creed who battled back and forth with a few people on different other views of theology, and it was good old St. Nicholas who pretty emphatically talked about Jesus being God the Father in the flesh. Then he went on a life of secret giving. He would dress up and walk through town. He knew most of the people in his parish. He was a bishop. And he would know that they were in need of generosity, so he'd give gifts. Even through some some gold, it's told, through some chimneys and things of a family who was about to go into bankruptcy and lose their three daughters because they didn't have the price of the dowry and their daughters were going to be into an indebted camp. And yet he put some gold at their house and near them to be generous to them. And it was the man whose daughters got the, the dowry money who followed him and discovered he was the bishop of their town. And so this real man in history... St. Nicholas is why one of the many names for Santa Claus came from a Bible-believing follower of Jesus who lived a secret life of secret generosity in expression for the generosity he experienced from God. And the same way your different Christmas traditions and understanding of Santa Claus is impacted by your culture, the same thing's true of your understanding of a father. Many of our fathers did a fantastic job. Many of us as fathers are doing a fantastic job. Oh, I'm not saying we don't make mistakes, but the, the transfer of, of, of kindness and patience and affirming, loving, proud dad to a heavenly father who feels the same was very easy for many of us and hopefully would be very easy for our kids. Others of us, it was more of a challenge. Our dad did a few things right, but he did a lot of things wrong. And so it was harder for us to understand a heavenly father, a father Christmas that would want to know us. In the passage I read earlier from Isaiah describes a very unique thing that happened in the Bethlehem manger, prophesied hundreds of years in advance. It said there would be a child sent by God, but it would also be a son who was given, physically born as a child, but given from the heavens. He not only would be a child, he would be a wonderful counselor, prince of peace. He'd also be the mighty God and look, the everlasting father. How could he be a father child, a God-man, a son child? 
And for years, people wrestled with how could the Messiah be a son and also be the Heavenly Father? You see, what we're going to discover in this series for the next few weeks is that God is the perfection, not the reflection of your earthly father. So everything your dad did right, your, the, the Heavenly Father is the perfection. It's all that times a thousand, the best version of that. The best version of that. And every time your dad did something wrong, as we all do as dads, and you said, I wish my dad could have said I love you more. I wish he could have told me he was proud of me for who I am, that's what I do. Your heavenly father is all those things you hoped your father could have been. And you can find in Father Christmas the perfect father you've always longed for. A father who's crazy about you and proud of you and went to the mat for you. When Jesus was writing in Matthew 4, he said, In one sense, all of us are rummaging around in darkness, and we're looking for a great light. And the great light was that God's light came to earth to shine forth and show that he was the ultimate heavenly father. And so today we're going to try and paint a new portrait portrait of a father. And whatever ways your dad did it well, we're going to try and just touch that up a little bit more, make it a little bit more technicolor. For the ways your dad maybe made mistakes or you're making mistakes, thank goodness it's not up to us. We're going to paint a picture of a unique father that came at Christmas with three brush strokes. The first thing we're going to do is paint a father who cradles kindness. One of the unique things that, of all the ways Jesus and God could have come to earth, he came in a cradle, in a manger, in a horse trough. And we see Mary you know, wrapping Jesus in swaddling clothes and cradling him together, being so kind and so tender. We also see at the same time that of all the ways God could have come, he came cradled in kindness. Soft and fragile, up close and personal. In the book of Titus, it describes the Christmas story in a very unique way. Paul was writing to a friend named Titus, and he said, Here's what I want you to think about when you think about Christmas. When the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. What a unique way to describe Christmas. When the kindness of God appeared on earth. When the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Notice a few things. Number one, this is a very unique philosophy, religion, and claim. You see, many religions, like the pantheist religion the Indians have, or the Eastern religions, say God is already here. He's the energy in you and in me. God wouldn't have to appear here. He's already here. The Western religions that teach that God is outside of his creation, Muslim, Judaism, Christianity... God is outside of his creation. So when bad stuff happens, that's not God. That's a creation run amok. But for the transcendent religions like like the Muslims, they would say, well, God is so transcendent, he would never come near. But Christianity teaches something unique to both the Western and Eastern religions. That the God who is transcendent, who made everything, appeared. He stepped in. He came into his creation. He wrote himself into the story that we would know him that we could be known by him, that we could understand him, that we could have his arms wrapped around us, that we could hear words from him saying, I love you, I'm proud of you, I care about you. And the phrase here, the love of God toward man, is where we get the word phileo. It's where we get the word philanthropy. It was the philanthropy of God. It was the phileo love of God toward human beings that motivated him, that drove him. Unlike other religions where the gods are angry with lightning bolts and don't even care about mankind, the God of the Christmas account is a God of love and kindness who so loved and phileoed and had such philanthropy toward those he made. We also get the word benevolence. He benevolently showed his kindness to us. That's a unique kind of God. He's a mighty God. He's a warrior. But he's also kind. And cradled his presence in kindness by appearing to us. In fact, the word kindness, a good way to define kindness is your ability to adjust your grip to someone else. So you meet up with somebody else, goes to shake your hand, and you shake their hand. You go to hold a baby, and you change your grip when you're holding a baby. That's kindness. 
You adjust your grip to someone's skills or someone's talents when you're mentoring them. Kindness is adjusting your approach to help the other person develop. And the incarnation, God becoming man, is about God adjusting his grip to come near to us. As a father, I get a chance to see this all the time. When we adopted my son 10 years ago, it was such an amazing moment to stand before that judge. And at that moment, when the gavel came down, my son Quinn became an heir. He was no longer a Ginsky. He was now a Hovind. And as a Hovind, he not only had access to all of our resources and into a relationship with our family, but he also got to experience the kindness of one of the things my son loves doing is, uh, my son Quinn, we've been skiing together for about six years. We love to ski, so we ski at Perfect North like twice a week. And so twice a week, he skis between my legs, and I ski in this position for about an hour and a half. These muscles, you know, don't work at all anymore. <laughs> about three weeks ago, per- uh, Winter Park out in Colorado opened early, and it was like, you know, $50 flight. So I took Quinn out there, and I thought, this is either going to be the stupidest thing I've ever done or the best. And so Quinn and I went and skied for about three days together. And just had a great time. And we are skiing along. And because he weighs about 70 pounds now, I mean, I got 70 pounds of snow plow going on on top of my own weight. And we are whipping down these mountains. And as we're going down, vroom, vroom, and I have to adjust my grip to him. I got to put my arms around him where he holds my fingers as we're going down and got to teach him how to steer. But mostly I'm doing all the steering. As we go whipping past this ski patrol guy, whoa, he's like, that's dangerous. What you're doing is dangerous. No duh. Yeah, no duh. <laughs> and I realize I am probably the world's expert autistic father skier in the world. <laughs> because I've been doing this for six years, about twice a week, for three months every year. I probably am the best autistic dad snowplow ski between my legs. It's a very niche uh, thing that I, I'm an expert <laughs> in. All he saw was chaos and danger. I'm like, yeah, but you know what? My son wouldn't be able to ski if I didn't adjust my approach. So yes, it puts me in danger. Yes, I had years my back didn't move. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but that's what fathers do. They adjust. On that same ski trip, all of a sudden, I got, my son Javen went with us as well. And about 11.30 at night, I had to call the police on my son Javen. What did Javen do? <laughs> what kind of a father calls the police on his son? See, already you don't know, am I a good dad or a bad dad? Is this a tough love moment? What happened here? See, when we got to Colorado, we found out one of Javen's favorite concerts was uh, happening right there in Denver. And so he took Arturo, um, which is our rental car. He actually drove into town to see this concert. And he called me up at 11.30. Dad, I asked. I asked the parking attendant. He told me it was going to be open until midnight. The concert got over at 11. I got back to the parking meter at 11.30. They've locked my car for the rest of the night. What do you want me to do? And all of a sudden, as a dad, I'm like, oh, how can I help? Thanks for calling. And this is actually the difference between religion and a relationship with God. Religion is, I'm in trouble. Don't call my dad. Relationship is, I'm in trouble. I better call my dad. And so I called the police. I'm like, hey, my son's stuck. Is there anything you can do? Well, it's private property. Nothing we can do. He could, I guess, sleep in the car for the next five hours. No, he can't even get to the car. He could sleep on the street for the next five hours. That's not going to work. Oh, uh, you could go to the local police and they could give you a motel voucher. Really? I didn't know that was an option. Ultimately, by the time I called him back, he found a way in and the security guard got out late and said, oh, I'm so sorry, I made a mistake. But all of a sudden you hear, oh, is he in trouble? Is he a good dad? With one simple line, like I called the police. And how many of us have done that with God? We don't experience God as a kind father who loves us, who who the first we want to call when we're in trouble. See, this is a father who cradles kindness. He's also a father. When you think of Christmas, I want you to think of a father who offers string-free love. Not like if you, then I, but string-free love. He goes on in that passage in Titus and said, when, when the love of God appeared, when the kindness of God appeared, something amazing happened. It was the kindness of our Savior. Our Savior, he rescued us from something. He, he came to us when we were in trouble. That's what it means to save, to rescue, to help us. And when he saved us, he saved us Not by works. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. Not by works. Of righteousness, which we have done. The message of Christmas is not, God, here's my resume of what I've done. Let me in. It's God saying, here's my resume of everything I've done. I'll change resumes with you. I'll take your resume that it's woefully inadequate, and I'll give you my resume. 
and you have full entrance to my favor and love based on what I have done for you. In fact, he goes on there and he says, for this is according to the mercy of God. What is mercy? See, if it's works, then it's string free. If I do things, God will do things. That's not a gift. That's a paycheck. There's nothing wrong with a paycheck. I do stuff, I get paid for it. That's not what he's describing here. It's not by works that you do stuff and then God does stuff. It's even when you don't do it right, even when you mess up, even when you don't live up to your own expectations or God's expectations, he still initiates towards you to rescue you from your inability to live up to your own standards. In fact, the word mercy literally means not getting what you deserve. And when you realize that Christmas is not, God, look what I deserve! But oh my goodness, please don't give me what I deserve. If all my secrets came out, right? What if I took the worst 10 seconds of your life? It turns out that you take a helmet off a guy and you bash him in the head with it. And it's played all over the news. And you're like, oh, I would never do that. Sure, maybe you wouldn't do that. What if I took the worst 10 seconds of any thought, any secret life, any moment, and we played that up on the screen today? And you got what you deserved for how you spoke, how you mocked, what you didn't do. Oh my goodness, I'd be in trouble. I'd have a lot more than one. See, mercy is not getting what you deserve. And this string-free love that God offers is not giving you what you do deserve, which is punishment, but giving you what you don't deserve, which is grace and forgiveness. And then when you receive that, when you get that, when you experience that, you want to go and do that for other people. You want to extend mercy to others as God has extended mercy to you. And that's hard! You ever had somebody betray you or stab you in the back? Maybe you just hung out with your family this week. Oh yeah, Chad, I got several of them. I sat down with dinner, ate some turkey with some of those people. And you're mad because of what they did or didn't do years ago. And you know exactly what they deserve! Yeah, probably do. The only way you're ever going to forgive them and get free from the bitterness is to experience a father who gave you mercy when you didn't deserve it. And because of what your father gave you, you can extend it to others. Not because they deserve it. They're probably still creeps. And honestly, most of them aren't going to change. And I'm not saying you don't have to have boundaries. I'm not saying they don't have to have consequences. But I'm saying if you want to be free from bitterness, the way you get free from bitterness is, God, I want to do unto others what you've done unto me. Merciful love. And you can't just sort of conjure yourself up to do that. You've got to experience mercy to extend mercy. I was reading a book last April called Ordering Your Private World. It's about getting your soul kind of in order. The author writes a story and tells a story about a father who was in his office just trying to be a better dad. He said, I think one of the reasons I'm having trouble with this whole God thing and the Bible thing is because my relationship with my dad was great, but it was always based on what I did. He said, well, tell me more. I'd show up you know, after a soccer game and say, Dad, did you see I scored a goal? My dad would say, yeah, but you missed two other ones. And again, my dad loved me. I love my dad. But it put in me this need. Always perform. Never enough. Never enough. There's always a string. There's always a string. I was talking to a guy a couple years ago who attended here at Horizon. He said, you know, my dad and I have a great relationship as long as we talk about sports, the weather, or we talk about what I've accomplished in business recently. But God's been doing some things in my soul as I've been studying the Bible for the first time and, and learning about a God who cares about how I feel, how I think, what I'm passionate about, cares about me, not just as who I am, not just what I do. And so I've tried to initiate that with my father to tell him the things I'm discovering about God, about about myself. And my dad's just very, very uncomfortable with that world. In fact, he almost wonders if I'm losing my edge. And I'm finding that I'm developing the best version of myself. As I discover a God who is the reflection of what my dad did right, but the perfection of what my dad didn't know how to do. So he's a God who cradles uh, uh, kindness. He's a God who has this this string-free kind of love. But thirdly, he's a God who pours out abundance. It's not like a God who's like, you know, one cough drop to share. He's just got very, very little, and now I've got a couple quarters I'll pass out. No, no, no. He goes on in Titus and says, this heavenly Father gushes forth in abundance. He 
pours out that love. He pours out his praise. He pours out his, I love you. I care about you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad I made you. Oh my goodness, I'd love to spend more time together. See, it's through the washing, he washes us by regenerating us or making us into a new person. He renews us through giving us the Holy Spirit who he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ. Abundantly poured it down. Don't think like, you know, pouring a pitcher, a little eyedropper of love or grace. All right, do a little bit better next time. Think Niagara Falls. <clears throat> gushing amounts of grace. Gushing amounts of forgiveness. Gushing amounts of praise. This is a father who, of everything he has going on in the universe, has time to prioritize He pulls the angels together. He sings songs over you, it says in the Bible. Sing songs over you. Or maybe that's not really a thing. If you're a guy, like, I'm going to sing a song over me. He brags on you to the angels. Let me tell you the unique skills and talents. Let me tell you what he's overcome. Let me tell you the, the things which he's managed to get through and still be faithful and still have integrity. Let me tell you, even though he fell down flat on his face, he called out to me and he found forgiveness and mercy in ways he wouldn't have if he hadn't fallen. And God just loves to brag on his children. He wants to brag on you and pour out that abundance and pour out that abundance through Christ our Savior. We've been justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned. When you receive the message of Christmas. By grace, not works. It's a gift. Grace, you get what you don't deserve. That we should become, there it is, heirs. The Christmas story is not you get another chance to try harder. No, 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 it's adoption. You are adopted into the family of God. And when you're adopted into God's family, you're an heir to everything that Father owns. Now, when you think about faith, Jesus, and Christmas, do you think about the fact that you, when you receive the Son of God into your life, that you become a son of God? Not in the same way he was fully God, but in the way that you're adopted into his family. He's no longer just your creator, he's your father. And you have full access to everything that father has, that he philanthropied upon you that he phileoed upon you, that he abundantly gushed into you at Christmas by kindly adapting himself and his grip to you and I. See, when you get that, it changes everything. It begins to transform your life and the decisions you make. You're so overwhelmed by God's generosity, you can't not be generous to others. Charles Schultz found that to be true, the writer of the Peanuts cartoon. He just returned from World War II. Oh, he grew up with plenty of religion going to a couple church services, but he never heard this main message of the Bible that God loved me enough to forgive me of everything I've done, past, present, future. I am now an heir to the king of kings. I'm an heir to the maker of the universe. This so transformed him that he began to just dive into the Bible, learning about the Bible, learning about this new heavenly father that he'd never experienced before. It so impacted him that it impacted his career. He wanted his career to bring joy to other people and also tell people, even in subtle ways, and sometimes not so subtle, about this father that he had found. The networks approached him and said, would you create a Christmas special for us? He said, sure. And so he made what we know as the Charlie Brown Christmas special. And they hated it! Oh, they hated it! The music was weird! Weird jazz music! Nobody's going to like that. The animation wasn't 30 frames a second. It was like 16 frames a second. Really flickery and looked really cheap. But what they really, really didn't want to take a risk on is he wanted to read the book of Luke from the Bible in his Christmas special. We're not going to read the Bible as part of a children's Christmas special. And yet he fought for it. He felt like this was part of his art form and his display of his values, what he wanted people to know about Christmas. And so he prevailed. It's become one of the number one Christmas shows for the last 30 plus years. But he also embedded some things in there that you may not remember. You see, Linus is a security blanket, right? It's his king. It's, 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 it's the thing that makes him feel, feel secure. It's the thing that makes him feel like he has an identity. When everything else is going wrong, at least he has a security blanket. But you know that in the Christmas special, he drops that blanket for the first time? Do you remember when he drops it? It's at the moment he's reading Luke 2, and then the angels say, Fear not, for I am with you. Huh. 
Charles Schultz wanted you to know that whatever you're hanging on to, your career, your reputation, your need to perform all the time, all that stuff's good stuff, but you're never going to have enough. But when you find this king who makes you an heir, you can finally drop your security blanket. It's no longer the source of your identity, what you do, how people feel about you, what country clubs you go to, what cars you drive, all good stuff. But not the heir of the universe. He also made the hero of the story a little stump of a tree. Because there's an old prophecy in the Old Testament that says the stump of Jacob would become the Messiah. And he makes Charlie Brown's kind of hero as a stump of a tree that everybody makes fun of. And they mock this tree. In fact, they mock the tree and Charlie Brown's trying to fix the tree. And you remember what happens? Charlie Brown kills the tree. He says, oh, I killed it! He kills the tree, the stump of a tree. But then they put some blankets around it. And what happens? That tree comes back to life again and look at that tree i mean it's monstrous it goes from like the twig of a tree here like like three leaves and it goes over here on the right it's like gigantic resurrected tree but the message of resurrection that the stump that was killed would be raised again and now the generous giving and celebration that happened in the peanuts cartoon was a celebration of that which was dead is now alive again this is the main message of the bible that charles schultz found when he discovered the jesus The Jesus story, which became the Jesus account, which became the truth that God came to earth for you and I and affected him generously giving of his life to other people. I would just encourage you, as you think this Christmas, what does it look like for you to be generous? If God has given you mercy, can you be generous with people who don't deserve it? If God has been kind to you and you didn't deserve it, how can you adjust your grip to be kind to other people? If there was a heavenly father who gave great riches to you to become his heir, how could you take the resources you've been given and be generous to other people? And I hope you're given to all kinds of things that you feel like are priorities, good things that experience and and help other people do great things. I hope this next 30 days you think about of all the ways you've grown spiritually, all the ways your spiritual education, your kids' education at Horizon is part of it, that you want to give generously to the work God's doing here. Because we want you to know a new type of father. In fact, today's a big day for us. We've been working on this for months. Today's the day that we're going to release an app. So you can actually go to your Google store, you can go to your Apple store, you can finally get the Horizon uh, app. It's actually horizonspacecc.com. And this we've cataloged the last 10 years of messages. So you can go on there, click on past messages. I'm looking for something about depression. I'm looking for something about leadership. And it will sort messages so you can find topics to learn, different passages of the Bible to help you grow spiritually in the new year. Many of you have given very, very financially and very, very generously this last year so that we could put cameras in place, so we could get our new room in place with our control room, so that we could have apps in place. We're about 30 to 45 days away from going live on video, assuming we have all of our licensing in place. Because we want to create tools that you can grow, that your friends can grow, that when you're out of town, you can literally pull up this app, you'll click on it, and starting in January, you'll be able to watch our services online wherever you are in the world. You'll be able to hit send and you'll send the video link to a friend. Say, hey, I know you went through a tough time. This was helpful to me. Hopefully it'll be helpful for you. We as a church want to give generously to our community. We want to take the unique things God's teaching us and use it to help other people discover a new kind of father. See, that's what happens when you find this new dad. You want to be as kind to others as this Father God has been to you. You want to be kind to others with this Father God kind of kindness. See, many of us don't have a Father God. We've got a God Father. Yeah, we'll make you an offer you can't refuse. And God comes into your life and says, you do what I say, I'm going to give a horse head in your bed. Con balls would help with this uh, impersonation right now. We've got the God Father. But God wants us to have the Father God and to experience the kindness of the Father God. And the Father God's kind of kindness would so impact us that we would demonstrate that kindness to others. I want you to pick someone. Actually, before you pick someone, I want you to receive a gift because you can't pass on what you don't have. And this morning, if you've never experienced the kindness of a God who loves you mercifully, string-free, abundantly gushing force generosity to you, then first receive that. Let God father you with a new type of fatherliness. Because until you experience that, you can try hard to be kind to your spouse or kind to your son who's rebelling or kind to your daughter who, you know, is keeping the grandkids from you or kind to your business partner who stabbed you in the back. You could try hard and it'll last about a week. 
But until you've experienced kindness and mercy, you can't extend it at that deep of a level. Make this the Christmas you receive the gift of God's kindness. And then pick somebody. Somebody you consider a scoundrel, an enemy, someone who's hurt you. Say, God, I'm going to try and pray for them, bless them, forgive them. And I want to try and be generous with the Father God kind of kindness to them. Receive the gift and pass it on. You know, Fred Rogers has become very, very popular with a new movie. He was once asked, how can you be successful? He said three things. Be kind. Be kind. And be kind. I don't know if you know, but Fred Rogers was a Presbyterian minister. He was a children's pastor before he got famous on his show. He had experienced the kindness of God. And he built a whole industry, a whole career on trying to teach other people about the kindness of God who cares about your inner world, cares about what's going on inside of you, not just what you do. In fact, one of the most incredible things he did was in 1969, even though officially the racial divide was over, there was still a lot of conflict up in Pittsburgh specifically, and blacks and whites not being able to share even a public pool together in a way that really translated into the culture. So he had an actor friend who he asked to play Sergeant Clemens, or Officer Clemens, and one of his TV shows in 1969, just a simple act of kindness to come against the cultural differences of racial uh, fighting going on in the city. He pulled out a, a pool. Oh, it's a hot day in the neighborhood, he said. Oh, Officer Clemens, come on over. Officer Clemens and him took off their socks together. Clemens being black, him being white. They took off their shoes and socks. He says, why don't we, why don't we just cool off in the pool together? And they cooled off in the pool together. And Officer Clemens says, well, I didn't bring a towel. Well, that's fine. We'll just share mine. And they shared a towel and they dried off together in a simple little moment in a simple TV show in a simple act of kindness. But it was Mr. Rogers' way of saying, we're all neighbors. We should treat each other kindly. Whatever our culture teaches us about disagreeing on politics or disagreeing on all these different important issues, but if we don't treat people like neighbors, if we can't be kind to one another, then we've missed out on our Heavenly Father and Creator's mandate that we are called to be kind with a Father God type of kindness. So maybe this morning you want to receive that type of kindness in your life. Why don't you pray with me as you begin this journey together? Father, this is a new type of father. Both a warrior and a friend. Everlasting, mighty God, yet a wonderful counselor. And many of us want that. We want to understand that. We want to implement that. So maybe you just want to pray right now to God. Say, God, I want you to be my Heavenly Father. I invite your mercy. Don't give me what I deserve. Give me what I don't deserve. I receive your gift of grace and forgiveness. And Father, teach me how to do unto others as you have done unto me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, one of the ways we want to be generous to our community is this year we're again attempting eight Christmas Eve services. And we hope this is a way that you and your family can celebrate Christmas together. We hope you can invite some neighbors or friends to do that. So our tickets go on sale. They're free. They're complimentary. Uh, the tickets become available today. Now, the reason we do tickets, you haven't been here before, is really because over eight services, we want to make sure everyone has a good spot. You don't end up sitting on the atrium or something. So there's eight services 10 a.m., 11 a.m., noon, and 1 p.m. No service at 2. We actually got to eat sometime, people. Uh, Then we have 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m., and 6 p.m. So complimentary tickets. Please grab what you need. If you end up not needing some of them, you can bring them back. We work really, really hard to make sure everyone can be accommodated on the service, the first or second choice that they ask, if at all possible. So grab those rear atrium. Invite your friends. We can't wait. The service we've been working on for six months for Bethlehem and talking about what's going to happen at Christmas Eve. You don't want to miss it. We look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week for part two of Father Christmas. Thanks so much. Merry Christmas.